before I, we start, we can briefly introduce ourselves. Um, I'm Sarah Dondara, I'm a curator at uh, ZKM since April 2020 and working on the convergence of art, technology and science. And uh, I'm Dari Mille, uh, I'm also curator at ZKM since uh, 10 years and I'm in charge of uh, big th thematic exhibitions in the museum. Today uh, we will speak about the term biomedia and the exhibition with uh, the same title and the uh, concept about contemporary hybrid ecosystems. Before we dive into the topic, we would just briefly introduce also the ZKM Art Institution. The institute is located in a huge uh, former um, uh, fact industrial factory and it has also a University of Arts and Design and Municipal Gallery in the same building. And uh, the ZKM is also called the Digital Bauhaus, uh, which is working on the connection of art and science and technology and has uh, the linkage of all media and arts. The public foundation is, was founded in 1989 and uh, focuses also a lot on the participation and activation of the user. Uh, focusing on the alliances uh, of economy, uh, politics in society, the institution also has uh, different departments, which are exhibition spaces, about 12,000 square meters, a media theater for performances and conferences, a research and development uh, and production department, the so-called Hertz Lab, and also a huge collection and archive and conservation department to preserve media art. So, and here is uh, one of the uh, examples of our past exhibitions, or it was not a mere exhibition, it was an event uh, with the title Globale. And it was a polyphonic event consisting of exhibitions, uh, different conferences, events, um, uh, and it was organized for the 300 um, anniversary, uh, years anniversary of the city. And uh, as a topic, we also had like um, new materials and new tools in this festival, digitization, convergence of art, uh, science and technology. Um, and uh, this is an exhibition by Ryoshi Ikeda, a Japanese artist uh, entitled Micro and, uh, Micro and Macro. And it was a good example also of uh, collaboration between arts and, society, uh, and science because he developed it together with uh, CERN uh, in Switzerland. And then uh, X Evolution uh, exhibition also belonging to the Globale uh, Festival, uh, focusing on new materials and uh, technologies and tools. And uh, here we have also an uh, example of Open Codes. It's an exhibition that um, was produced at the ZKM and then also traveled uh, a bit around the world. Uh, and uh, last year it was shown uh, part of it, um, also modified part of it, shown at the Namjoon Park Center in Seoul. And uh, basically when we, we organize uh, touring exhibitions, we always do it in co-creation with the local uh, institution and uh, our motto is uh, uh, act locally, think globally. And uh, also one of the features of this exhibition, a new feature was uh, collaborating with uh, civil society from the city, uh, local civil society. And um, this is something we also um, tried to, to do in the touring exhibition. And uh, at the moment, uh, next to solo exhibitions, we are planning uh, bigger group thematical exhibitions. And for uh, beginning of 2023 will be uh, like an overview of the last 20 years um, under the directorship, artistic directorship of Peter Weibel. So it will be like the, the evolution or also the narrative from the former exhibitions about uh, the convergence of art and science. And uh, the ZKM is also going into the public space in the city center. So we have, for example, uh, the Schlosslichtspiele, which is like a huge um, project mapping on the castle of the city, uh, which new developments uh, by global uh, uh, international artists. And as well, we have like every year since uh, 2015 public uh, uh, project that is called Season of Media Art. Um, we have like media art in different locations, also unexpected spaces uh, in the city center. 
And now coming to the topic of the biophilic program that ZKM followed in 2021-2022, uh, we had three major exhibitions uh, at ZKM, which was from the beginning, the beauty of early life, the really first organisms, then also art and techno uh, or plant and technology interactions with the artwork of a living system. And then also uh, a look into the future with the biomedia exhibition, the or a symbiosis, not just with organic, but also artificial agencies. So today we're focusing also on the biomedia exhibition, uh, which had the subtitle, The Age of Media with Lifelike Behavior. Uh, and the bio and biomedia comes from life and the question, what is life? What do we read into life? Uh, is it like what defines or who defines life? Is it coming from the motion, from movement, from communication or from emotions? The major question was also what possible solutions uh, do new alliances or communities of human, non-human, more than human or technological en uh, entities open up for a current crisis. So the term uh, by media was, uh, oh sorry, <laughs> was uh, about the media, media theoretical approach, but I can tell more about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, so in the background of uh, the uh, exhibition concept was the idea of Peter Weibel that he has been developing since the 80s. Uh, also his media theory about the um, yeah, direction of coming from the moving uh, machines to moving media and biomedia. And uh, with this approach, we uh, really excluded also organic material or like uh, real bio art from the exhibition. And we really focused only on this live simulation through technological systems. And uh, also through this historical development of media or technology, we have uh, three um, um, characteristics like virtuality, variability of image uh, that lead to viability of image or to this lifelike behavior. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this regard, also uh, the development of cybernetic uh, art and cybernetics is important and this uh, feedback loops and also input and output uh, relation. Like uh, you can interact with the artworks, you give input and then you get an unpredictable output. And uh, since uh, technology can nowadays also simulate this uh, behavior of organic organisms, uh, we as uh, actors, as humans, can also interact with uh, this technology. Um, yeah, and so um, this was the theoretical part, but also, of course, for us as curators, uh, the question about uh, which role these systems play in, nowadays in the society was uh, very important. And also uh, the look into the future also as uh, here in the festival, like what forms of uh, coexistence we can find with uh, these technologies. And uh, here we tried also to find, um, um, with help of our artistic works with artists together, uh, also um, uh, answers to the questions of relationships and uh, interconnectivity or interdependence with uh, these technologies. Uh, and uh, also perhaps to dissolve a bit this uh, dualism of nature and culture and what Peter Weibel already said in his speech yesterday, a uh, recorded speech that we can only think of uh, culture in terms of nature and of nature in terms of culture nowadays. So with this exhibition we looked at uh, the notion of hybrid ecosystems that we face nowadays and also in the future. Uh, because technical um, or technology devices uh, and technical entities are in our everyday life um, integrated, uh, deep, deeply integrated. Mm -hmm. So we look at the dynamic technologies that, uh, or technological systems that can uh, autonomously react to offer life forms or uh, to other life forms or to their surroundings, learn from experiences uh, and develop an unforeseeable uh, behavior. So we were looking uh, at artworks that introduce like this uh, mutual influences with organic systems, inorganic intelligent systems and the interaction with human beings. So for example, we showed an artwork uh, Life in the Mind by Random International. 
uh, which was uh, existing out of like a million of objects moving together in a perfect harmony in a swarm and really interacting with the human beings in front of it, aligning with the, uh, with the movements and reactions of the user. So the display here was also chosen to be screens with like spaces in between so that the virtual swarm could also expand into the physical space. And one question that uh, was also intended uh, to be asked was uh, if uh, human beings can feel empathy towards digital agents, uh, if tw uh, towards movement and also a re uh, direct reaction to the uh, own behavior. Uh, the artist Jake Alvis looked uh, at the uh, interaction between uh, organic or like animals, uh, birds in a swamp area and uh, digital agents where, without like a direct uh, interference of human beings. So he uh, invented like uh, new forms or shapes of birds that were uh, generated by neural uh, network GAN system and then also introduced them into the swamp system and let the uh, organic birds, the real birds, interact with them. Uh, the artist Christine Mar, uh, for example, introduced like a so-called supraorganism, which uh, is a term from uh, biology um, that uh, describes uh, the behavior of individual organisms that work together as an own bigger supraorganism. So here the behavior of a real bee swarm was tracked and uh, detected uh, and then also machine learning system was trained with it. Uh, and the artist built like this really own ecosystem that reacts to each other, like all the, the small parts are moving and making sound uh, in relation to their own behavior. And also the user entering the space can interact with the, the, uh, the swarm. So also a lot of artists, of course, fun uh, focusing on the, the sixth extinction or what is happening with the loss of biodiversity. So for example, Jakob Kutstensen focused on an already extinct bird from Hawaiian Island. So he re reproduced and scanned uh, the landscape and uh, also the plants of this Hawaiian island and transformed it in a VR installation into a new reality, new ecosystem where the extinct bird is, bird is also coming to life again. So this installation, for instance, creates an environment where visitors uh, can experience their own active involvement and influence on past and future ecologies uh, with their own senses. And with the uh, exhibition, we also looked in uh, now uh, current or future developments like, for example, quantum computing. So we had the pleasure uh, to invite Libby Heaney, who is also a um, quantum physicist and uh, doing artist practice, and she focuses on the hybridity and also non-binary idea of the ecosystems that could uh, that are there, but also how they could experience and what that will change in the perception of the ecosystems. In this piece, uh, the artist also speculates about the multiple po potential futures uh, that uses quantum computing and on how this uh, new technology will develop in the future and what impact it might have on society and ecosystems. So here she introduced uh, new non-binary hybrid creatures and also those new companions were part of another section of the exhibition. And uh, already like 30 years ago, um, Donna Haraway in her uh, Cyborg Manifesto uh, was speaking about uh, this um, ambiguous um, yeah, relationship or like that it's not possible anymore to tell um, uh, organic and unorganic systems from each other. Uh, machines have made uh, thoroughly ambiguous the difference between natural and artificial mind and body, self-developing and uh, ex externally designed, and many other distinctions that used to apply to organisms and machines. Okay. And uh, in fact, some researchers posit that uh, it's not the material composition, like uh, organic versus unorganic, but it's more like the way in which uh, organisms process information that uh, is uh, character main characteristics of uh, life itself. 
And for example, John von Neumann, who is a pioneering computer scientist, he also described uh, life as a process that can be abstracted through media. And uh, so life can also be simulated in systems which are not part of natural evolution, but belong to the field of digital media. And uh, not least, uh, in the face of uh, ecological crisis, we have to ask ourselves if it's only also natural um, um, organisms or if it's also uh, yeah, um, core co beings like artificial and technology, te technological entities that can be our companions. Mm. And uh, in this section of the exhibition, we explored like new forms also of uh, participatory uh, interaction with these uh, so-called new companions. Mm. So here, for example, it's um, a self-generative uh, installation by uh, the artist collective Universal Everything. And it's called Infinity uh, because it's um, um, eternal uh, yeah, parade of uh, these uh, monsters that you see on the screen and uh, uh, they are generated according to certain uh, characteristics like uh, color and shape and uh, the uh, speed of, the, of their pace. And in the exhibition we mixed also contemporary artworks with older ones. Uh, this is an installation uh, from the year 1994 by Christa Zomera and uh, Laurent Mignonot. And uh, it's a virtual interactive environment uh, with the title A Volver, or like artificial uh, evolution. And um, it's uh, inhabited by a series of artificial organisms that the visitors can create themselves. Uh, then we also uh, had the topic of smart assistants and devices because also uh, these uh, things are, can also be uh, considered as our new companions. <laughs> and uh, this is an example of um, augmented reality environment created by uh, the artist Aristarch Chernyshov. And um, it's kind of hybrid um, and uh, genetically modified leech and a smartphone. Uh, and it lives uh, on person's bodies, feeds on their blood, uh, and in return provides informational, informational inclusion and uh, concern for their health. <laughs> so this is um, basically a wearable uh, creature, and uh, it uh, provides observation or like control our body, but also provides gentle care about our body. Then we had also robotic companions, like this is um, Spider by Fabien Zocco, who uh, basically is connected uh, uh, through um, a smartwatch to the body of artist, and artist is wearing uh, this watch all the time when the robot uh, is uh, presented in the exhibition. And uh, this robot can also express uh, emotions of the artist, but in a robotic form. <laughs> Uh, in the exhibition, you could also sing with uh, jellyfish, uh, and jellyfish would react to uh, your voice uh, in the virtual, um, yeah, virtual installation by uh, Melody Musset. Uh, then here we merged a bit exhibition sections, and we had a special section also about robots. Um, and there was also a question like um, uh, about Android robots, and also about um, the. Um, um, more animal, <laughs> like animal-shaped uh, robots, and also like uh, what we uh, expect uh, from robotic technology. Should it really like have this human appearance, or uh, is, can it be also abstracted from humans? And as in our uh, numerous exhibition, we also merged uh, artistic works with uh, technological and also scientific developments. And uh, we had also a living lab situation by the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology uh, that was presented in one of the exhibition rooms and uh, where um, the pepper uh, that you probably all know, the, the simple robot uh, could interact uh, with the visitors and uh, scientists could uh, explore, so to speak, interaction of humans and uh, robotic systems uh, in real life. Uh, also another example of scientific presentation, different robotic labs of EPFL, which is uh, Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne, uh, also showcased their research, robotic research. Mm. Um, then we had a chapter about artificial evolution because it's also an important part of uh, development of the technology. 
And the question that we posed here was like, can we um, or are we together with our digital companions uh, undergoing a form of core evolution? Mm. So there is this historical part um, that was shown with these books, for example, um, because already in the 50s, uh, scientists started to develop uh, systems that, uh, or technological systems that could show also uh, the steps of evolution. Uh, but um, despite of these historical developments, like practical applications have uh, come to, the, um, to be dominated uh, primarily by self-learning algorithms and uh, deep reinforcement learning technologies nowadays. Because these new technologies, they enable uh, computer, computers not merely to simulate lifelike behavior, but also to learn uh, how to imitate uh, this behavior themselves. Mm. Uh, so this is an example of uh, virtual or like digital uh, ecosystem environments that was created by Sasha Poflip, Alessia Nigretia, and uh, Lutz Matthew. And uh, they were inspired by the collection of the State Darwin Museum in Moscow and uh, selected objects which, uh, with, the, uh, with which they worked and then developed this um, ecosystem based on this um, objects and um, they used a genetic algorithm to create uh, this self-generative digital biosphere and uh, this ecosystem consists of artificial life forms that evolve over time uh, a set of self-propelled resource entities uh, that are consumed by the organisms and an environment uh, with which uh, they are both um, they both interact and in which they are both embedded so, and this is uh, an example by Ham van den Doppel. Uh, it's a Dutch artist that uh, created the mutant garden here. You can also experience this artwork in the digital platform that we present in the upper floor. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the idea here was that it's not only um, um, uh, uh, data that mutates, but it's uh, also the software that mutates the computer code itself. And uh, here he used the historical uh, algorithm that is called Cartesian algorithm. And it's called Cartesian because it uh, represents a computer program as a two-dimensional grid consisting of nodes and layers. And the artist's intention was to highlight the evolutionary process in the recent history of computation, mm -hmm. approaching it as an algorithmic archaeology. Uh, we had also an artwork by um, Artificial Nature, uh, Haru G and Graham Wakefield. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they all also presented this work in Korea some years ago, uh, but they always uh, tried to make then a site-specific uh, version and we, they uh, reworked and redeveloped it for the exhibition space at the ZKM. Uh, it's a mixed reality in, uh, installation and uh, it uh, involves a network of um, motor actuated bells that you can hear. And it uh, also consists of salt, you see it on the floor and uh, there is a projection of uh, the creatures, um, of shadows of these creatures on the salt as well. And the creatures you can uh, experience in uh, these goggles, but at the same time in the real space. And uh, the artists also developed new creatures that were based on the history of the ZKM, because um, I don't know if you know it, but the ZKM is a former munition factory. So they developed like uh, also new um, organisms uh, that were like snake-like metallic entities uh, shaped a bit like um, know, patron patrons. <laughs> Um, and that um, yeah, inhabits this uh, building of the ZKM based on the, fact, uh, on the fact that it was a munitions factory. Then uh, non-human communication was also a big focus uh, on creating hybrid systems, not just involving human beings, but also the interaction between technical uh, agencies, but also plant and machine interaction. Mm. So we showed, for example, historic uh, reconstruction work um, by Gordon Pask, which is uh, the colloquy of mobiles, uh, which is one of the really first cybernetic artworks uh, that shows like the really communication between the technical entities. Mm. And transforming this also in the 21st century, we had a work by uh, the artist Birk Schmidthusen, where two AI systems are communicating with each other towards light and language. Mm. And here we have like communication of two entities, but we showed also, for example, a more self-reflective art piece by Christian Mio Leclerc, where it's really like what the, the name already says, Narcissus, an AI system that 
um, uh, really watches itself in a mirror and then tries to understand or reflect what the what it sees or what the AI is about. So, for example, here there is also the question uh, of uh, self-awareness or self-perception is exclusively a, a human trait. And also coming from the self-reflection, uh, we showed a piece by uh, Spela Petric, which is going to like no, a really collaboration or communication or let's say a play, as the name says, uh, between cucumber plants and AI-driven robots. Mm -hmm. So here, uh, it is like really more like a playful game, mm -hmm. well, which can function but doesn't have to be. So it's also a scientific piece that uh, also um, collects the data that is um, collected during like the exhibition span and shows if the, collect the connection, the you know, relation between the AI or the robots and the plants are functioning. Mm -hmm. And opening up the display, uh, we had also the Empathy Swarm by Adam uh, Don um, Donovan and Catherine Horshu. Uh, which is uh, a robotic swarm uh, by of uh, 25 small robots that uh, live in their own habitat and where humans are invited to enter and also interact with the swarm. Mm -hmm. And as the name of this uh, piece says, uh, it's about empathy. So the artist gave like also an introduction for the, the user to enter the habitat. So really like taking care. Uh, not uh, covering up the robots so that they can still move. Then there were also a change of color uh, depending on the behavior or the regrouping of certain robots. And also this piece, at least with the digital version, you can also interact on the digital platform which is on the display uh, in the upper floor. Uh, when it was installed in the space, it was also pops possible to connect via the platform with one of the robots and then also interact with the swarm from virtual space, but also with the human being in the physical space. And we were also thinking of uh, not just the artworks as like hybrid ecosystems, but also the exhibition space as a living organism in itself. So we had, for example, breathing walls that aligned with the own breath or like small robots that were cruising around in the physical space, uh, giving speech or reacting to the, the audience in the physical space. And the topic of e hybrid ecosystems also plays a huge role nowadays in architecture development. So uh, we invited uh, the um, Center of Information Technology of the Royal Danish Academy in Denmark, uh, who are doing a lot of research in also sustainable architecture to develop like a huge uh, facade infrastructure that was also briefing in and out during the exhibition time. So here this project on the one hand focused on sustainable ways to use, for example, uh, AI systems or com computer systems to really create um, uh, like perfect patches that have like no cutouts or uh, overuse uh, material. Um, but then on the other hand, it also questions the interaction with the space and the architecture, uh, if there could be also different scenarios or for living in uh, structures than just having walls, windows, but rather also translucent uh, structures and architecture that also reacts be it to the human uh, being in the architecture, but also to, for example, humidity levels. So coming from the exhibition space as a living system, we were also wondering, because it was pandemic times, uh, how could also an opening of an exhibition be uh, where, uh, not with humans, but with uh, uh, technical entities? So we had uh, like the persona B Media opening uh, the exhibition uh, and we had also a performance by a satellite interacting with an ISIS uh, system and also a MIDI uh, piano. So it was an opening by technical entities. Mm. And then also this entity moved into the exhibition space uh, in 
the let's uh, educational part, which was in the center of the exhibition space, uh, we called it the mimisphere. So mimesis and the atmosphere, the where also the visitors can come and uh, have like a workshop experience. And so we used also the scenography, which was like made of the screen screen and blue screen technology, um, or like the the colors that are used for filmmaking. And we had, for example, a lot of hybrid workshops uh, working with this technique. Mm. And then moving from also the physical space, we moved to the hybrid space with the digital platform. So here we uh, created together also with our educational department uh, a virtual entity uh, like a, a platform as a persona itself. So this B Media is uh, interacting with uh, the user, but also misbehaving in a sense. And also on this digital platform, you can experience like four artworks that are also hybrid, and one of them is ATB, and so we no longer want to <laughs> uh, take the time and also give the word uh, to them to uh, show their artworks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, greetings, everybody. So we are uh, AATB. Andrea Anner and Thibaut Brevet. Um, we are very happy to be in Seoul and we thank uh, Unfold, X and also ZKM for having uh, allowed us to participate in this show. Um, so we will briefly explain um, how our practice came together. Um, our practice, we called it a practice for non-industrial robotics. We met about 10 years ago. Um, and initially we had a design practice uh, and we were very much interested in mechanical system to work as designers. Um, but more and more we started to build machines that became too complicated to just focus on that. So we started to use uh, big industrial robots. Um, at this time it was... And um, what was striking for us was that uh, in art and design these machines have been very lightly explored and we felt that there was really... Um, a very fertile ground to 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 explore our uh, and further continue our practice in this direction. So, so we went on eBay and we just bought a robot. Um, very normal thing to do, and we then had to figure out uh, how it works. So um, we spent quite a lot of time to figure out the ins and outs because we have absolutely no like academic expertise in robotics. Um, but that also meant that we didn't have to ask permission to do anything because we, that was our robot and everything that would have been forbidden in a university um, was completely up to us. Mm -hmm. So we started by doing a lot of um, manufacturing experiments, like ways of producing things because uh, we were very much interested in the design potential of robots as a, as a tool. And so we did a lot of experiments, for example, type design experiments with some uh, students in an uh, art school in Switzerland. Um, but we also started to realize that these machines are very dangerous. So they have been never meant to be sharing the same space mm -hmm. as humans. Mm -hmm. uh, all these robots have been historically in factories and they have never been meant to be or thought or engineered to be near humans. They have been meant to be excluded from the space uh, we inhabit. Um, so that was kind of a problem because we were interested to work as close as we could with these machines. And about five years ago, there was a bit of a breakthrough moment for us because what you see here on the orange part is a, an old robot. It's the very dangerous ones that you have that build cars and are very not supposed to be close to us. But attached at the end, you have this kind of gray and blue robot, which is called a collaborative robot. And um, that was a complete change of perspective for us because these new generations of robots have been thought to share space with humans. They are much more safe. And so it meant that if the orange one was supposed to be excluded from our living space, the gray one is supposed to be sharing the same space. Um, so robots and humans can be together uh, interacting. Mm -hmm. So that started um, what we titled uh, a practice for non-industrial robotics for our studio to really explore everything that is not an industrial setting. 
And so we started to collaborate with other artists and other designers. And we started to invent new ways of working. So these machines are essentially the muscles, but there is no brain. The software, the code to program them doesn't exist pretty much. And so we had to develop these tools and invent these new ways of working. So this was, for example, a collaboration with a fellow Swiss artist that was working on uh, concrete molds. And so we wrote a software and with him we could design um, molds that were produced with this technique. And from this, um, these foam castings, um, he was uh, doing extremely large scale uh, concrete castings for a public building uh, for a commission uh, in Switzerland. We've been also exploring different types of production systems for um, uh, large scale printing experiments. Um, so this uh, technique actually is something that we developed in an art foundation in the south of France called Luma. And they commissioned us to make a very large scale print um, for an event. And so the problem was that all this print had to be done with some algae pigment. So we had to print with an ink that is just not possible to put in a printer. So we developed an entire technique to print with robots. And from this, um, we had a large scale uh, print at the end. Okay. So it's quite an interesting um, approach for us to work with this robot. Um, it's developing a new way of uh, working for us. But, uh, these are experiments that we've been doing also for wool felting. So we are in collaborating with uh, some designers Together we are developing this new practice for felting, so it's really more an applied research here. But what is interesting is um, that it's not just about the result, it's also about the process. Like um, we can see here, that we are trusting the robot, learning to try the robot. Um, these needles are very close, but uh, because the robot, we know that it's perfect and it's going to do exactly the same thing, we start to get a bit uh, close for comfort as well sometimes. And so for us, it's a bit reinventing a new way of working. Like um, it's a new craft. It's a sort of new future craft of working with a robot. Um, and it's really um, changing the way uh, as artists and designer, we are working um, day to day in our studio and in our research. So in the last past few projects, we have given you an insight into different production uh, techniques where we are using robots in our design practice and we are researching on how to use these tools and how, how to use robots as tool in a design process. But we are not only using robots as design tools, we are also thinking about the, the, the positions who robots could have when they would be integrated in our everyday life. So these are results from a one week workshop we gave in a design school. And the brief was really to think about how we could coexist with robots in the future. A robot can also be a tool to move something in space and time in a very precise manner. So this was an installation we showed at the Design Biennial in Milan, and it's an artificial, artificial sundial. So the robot moves a, sun, moves a light and um, as if an artificial sun is moving a light. And here it was shown in an art, uh, accelerated version, but when we showed it again in another exhibition in the, at Ars Electronica in Linz, in a bunker deep down, it became much more impressive. It was really like you, you would kind of like go down and down and down, like 20 minutes. And then when you reached to see this artwork, you could really reconnect to the sun that was outside, because when going down, you have kind of lost orientation, but then like imagining that the sun outside would be at this exact same position, it was kind of reconnecting us with the sun and nature. Mm. This is a piece that we called um, Soap Opera, and it was commissioned by the V&A Dundee, and it was, um, 
a bubble blowing robot. We have discovered that in the in the Vanitas paintings in the in the from uh, the Dutch painters, there was always an image of a bubble blowing child, and this image of a bubble blowing child uh, meant the like the fragility of life. What we found interesting was also when in this image of the fragility of life and the soap bubble as an image for it, what, what does it mean when this action gets replaced by a robot? So in a way, it's an endless action of like an endless soap blowing, blowing bubble machine. In the same manner, we also wanted to try to question what does it mean when we play with two robots. So in this installation that we called Big Players, we, we placed the, the skip, we, it allowed you to, to skip ropes between two robots. But in, in the way by replacing the, the rope skipping humans with robots, it also puts more attention to the person playing and so puts the attention on the big player itself. Mm. And in the last project we show, entitled Handshake, that we also have the pleasure to show here, um, that was developed during lockdown. The situation was as followed. We were invited to go to an exhibition in New York, but it was during the first lockdown, so it got cancelled. But then we got contacted by the curator who encouraged us to develop an installation that could be um, like could be visible from all our homes in lockdown so that would mean a website mm -hmm. so we developed the interactive robotic installation that was consisting of a webcam filming two robots installed in our studio and at each end of the robot there was a huge and attached and users of the website could log, log on to and then by logging in they can take control of one of the hands. So this allowed during lockdown to people to reconnect and we, in this installation we really physically reconnected people all over the world and was really in a way for us it was quite nice to see because in our in this installation our desks where we work were just behind the webcam or in between the webcam and these hands and so we could always hear visitors enter our studio when we could hear the hands moving in our backs and so we could also reconnect to the visitors of this uh, artwork mm -hmm. and so we are extremely happy and thankful that we could bring it here to Seoul and uh, Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Um, I have to stand up because I have a little pain in the back. So, yeah, welcome and um, thank you, uh, Sengar, for the invitation. I'm very grateful to be here in Seoul. Uh, my name is Moritz Simon Geist. I'm a robotic musician. So, um, uh, people always ask me like um, you have to put your uh, you have to put something um, on your uh, on the schedule like what are you so I always say like I'm a robotic musician I'm a music producer or a ro robotic engineer but then the next question is always like okay you're a robotic musician but I mean I don't know what that is and so um, so I'm trying to explain so a part of my um, uh, of my work is of course related to music. And um, another part is related to building robots. Um, a little bit uh, as like for a ATB, but we are building um, mostly the mechanics also ourselves. That's also why they look li a little different, not so industrial. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, a um, big part is like thinking about the future because for me, um, I will explain later, I'm coming from a musical background and for me, uh, making music with robots is also a lot about thinking about how art and technology can be implemented in the future. Um, and also, of course, as I'm running a studio, I have a small um, business site and um, I'm somewhere here in the middle. Um, yeah, so um, I have a studio in Dresden, Germany. 
um, which are run for almost, um, so this particular study for two years and all in all for 10 years. Um, it looks like this. Yeah, and there we develop um, a, a different kind of mechanic, um, mechanical structures for music making. And I also have a wonderful team, and some of them are also here. I want to mention them, Annika, uh, Annika and Jonas. Okay, so but now you're probably wondering, okay, I, this is nice talking, but I want to see something what you are actually doing. So I'm uh, going to just show some of my works now. With music, it's a little bit of light entertainment. Thank you for listening. And um, so, as you could see, this was my first, or oh, you could not see, but this was my first um, installation in 2012. So, um, I did not have any connection with the art world. Um, I was a PhD student um, in a research facility in Dresden, and I was more in semiconductor science and building organic LEDs. So, but at some point I realized because I had been making music and also because I had been working with electronics um, for my whole life um, that I uh, would like more to work in the arts field and then I skipped my PhD and um, I started to work on this art piece and it was a viral hit in the internet. So uh, the idea here was um, to um, take a very old electronic drum computer called MR808, uh, called TR808, um, which is one of the most iconic music machines and build a robot out of that. So I took all the electronic sounds and through like a three-year process, I um, basically replaced all of the electronic sounds with like the small sound machines. It was a very difficult process, but it was a very good learning experience for me. Um, and so for uh, the next two years or three years, I was touring with this robot a lot and I was playing a lot of concerts and shows, but I soon realized that it's very big. It's um, maybe from here to over there and it's like 350 kilograms. So I built another robot. Mm. This was actually the robot I brought here yesterday and I also want to show you a video for those who could not be here.
Um, yeah, thank you. Um, the um, video is more longer and you can see on the internet how it goes on. It has a second part. So um, the first robot I built was a reference to an old drum computer and this um, I, de uh, I developed together with like, some designer friends. So the idea was um, to have not a reference back to something that already exists. For example, I did not take a violin or like a piano or something, but to develop something very futuristic. So um, that's basically why we chose this um, very abstract structure. Um, we did a lot of prototypes, small prototypes, where we tested out um, different kinds of um, configurations for the five small robots. And we chose this pyramid um, configuration. Um, so basically you have five different uh, robots inside and each of them make like a very specific sound which we developed over several years. For example, here you can see uh, one robot which is uh, a reference to an African instrument called uh, kalimba. Um, because it's basically uh, these metal tongs and they are beaten by small solenoids and um, I tried to make like an automated or like a futuristic version of this old um, traditional African instrument. Um, so without a video I want to uh, just a little bit talk about my latest installation called Vibrations. Um, because the works I had been doing until 2019 were uh, only percussion, only rhythm robots and I felt that I need, um, as like a music person, I need more of an instrument which I can play melodies with. Um, so I was thinking maybe I take like a piano and make a robotic version out of that or I take um, something else. But then I found one very interesting um, instrument which um, can be a very futuristic uh, shape. So this is a vibraphone, a very classic um, jazz instrument and I was immediately in love with the sound because it has like a very um, synthetic or um, yeah, abstract character to it. But of course this one is built so that a human can play it, so basically it has this size as a table and when I'm here with my two arms I can reach every tone, but when I wanted to make like an automated version out of that it doesn't have to be this shape, so we developed like a different shape. So basically the idea was to spread out all the tones, these are the different um, tone plates in the room so that you have like a spatial sound or a room sound. So this uh, instrument is still in development or it's finished but um, in December we will only shoot the video and if I'm back uh, someone I can show you the video. So uh, thank you for listening. Gamsamita.